was online. Uh, this is the first of uh, a masterclass series of events that uh, I, as the director of external partnership and engagement, uh, is coordinating together with the support of colleagues, depending on who the masterclass. Uh, as, a, as a matter of starting, we are recording this session. Uh, so please be aware of that so we can actually post it on our website and the colleagues and the students can catch up afterwards. Uh, as I said, I coordinate this, this series together with various colleagues, but for this specific speaker, Fabienne has been uh, extremely useful uh, in all sorts. So thank you, Fabienne. Today wouldn't happen without me. And it is my greatest pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Miles uh, today with us. Uh, Miles is a former New Scotland York detective uh, surgeon, so I had to write it down because <laughs> I didn't want to get it wrong. And uh, he's, he's going to tell you everything about, I want to spoil too much, like I do with my own slides, but I think uh, uh, today's masterclass is um, a showcase of how decision-making at the individual level, within organization and beyond, so between an external and internal uh, country relationship, uh, decision-making isn't easy. Uh, he has been working uh, together with his team and colleagues and organization. Uh, he's been working under uh, crisis scenarios. So as we know, when we are under a crisis moment, creativity, now we talk about creativity in a resource-constrained environment, gets sparked. Now, decision-making and crisis, what does it happen? Do we make the wrong decision? If we make the wrong decision, we are in trouble, right? Do we make the right decision? We could. So I guess uh, uh, Miles is going to unpack a bit of that. Um, as part of this masterclass series, we also try to select speakers who tell us a, a, an interesting story. And what called me personally when uh, Fabian introduced Miles uh, to myself uh, and thinking of you know the pros and the needs of a school as a school for business society is that someone like you in your position uh, has been in, in that constant tension or challenge of having to redefine what individual values are, organizational values are, and what is not tagged and termed as a value, but still is a, a matter for, for society, right? And we have done that across national boundaries. So, yeah. again, something you need to touch on. Yeah. Without any further ado, <laughs> thank you, Miles. I thank will you. sit in my corner and I look forward to your talk. Cool. Thank uh, you. I also should say that Miles is happy to just talk to your questions yes. throughout. Okay. Yeah, that's that's important. But uh, you, if you have a question, just stick your hand up or shout out. I'm not. Uh, I'm okay. Oh, you okay? Yeah. Yeah. I've got to stay around here, which is really alien to me because normally I walk all over. But can you hear me at the back there? You, you can hear me. Yeah. Apparently this is on. Um, yeah. Uh, as Beatrice just said, that that's me, Miles Manning. I am a former detective sergeant uh, in the Counterterrorism Command in the Metropolitan Police. Uh, I worked on um, national and international level. Um, for the last sort of 15 years, I was doing stuff with the Cacatero Command around um, uh, prison intelligence and all that sort of stuff uh, as well. But this just to prove that I actually was a police officer. Uh, a lot of people, I, I do this, this talk all over, all over the country. Next week, I'm going to Plymouth to do it. The week after that, I'm going to Ukraine for a week to do some, some training over there as well on this, on this subject. And the week after that, I'm up to, to, to Newcastle to do the, the, that training as well. So I get around a bit doing, doing this sort of decision making and um, uh, sort of uh, talk that I do. Now, um, I do it for free. <laughs> so I don't charge anyone um, because I think this is quite an important thing for you to know. And I mainly do it for travel and tourism students and policing students as well. Uh, the travel and tourism will become clear because right halfway through, at the sort of mid section of this is all about the terror attack that took place in, in Tunisia where, where I was deployed to um, and the sort of shortcomings within the travel and tourism industry that I've tried to sort of fill, uh, I'm having huge problems. So what I do is I go in at this level and uh, at, at the students level and hopefully in the future, some management, uh, that some of those students will become managers and recognize that there is need and input for the crisis management side of things, which is they, they don't get it as much. But this is me. You can see bottom left corner. I've got, usually got a pointer that I can point thing, but it doesn't work on a TV. But you see the bottom left corner. If any of you are 21 years old, that's what I looked like at 21 when I was in, in, in the military there. Uh, and then uh, about four or five years later, I did six years all together in the military. 
I joined the police. You can see top right hand corner. There's me at my pass out parade with my father. And then you can see one of the very, very, these are probably the only two out of three photographs that I've got um, of me in uniform. Nowadays, you've got photographs galore, haven't you? Um, but this was, um, that, that's the only sort of photograph I've got of me in uniform uh, with my sister. And right on cue, that's my sister out there. I, I, I've got a great affection for York. My sister lives here. I came to school here. Uh, my sister's asked to come along and watch it. So, <laughs> Go in. So I do apologise for my sister being late as well. It's <laughs> 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 okay, no worries. No worries. No worries. Right. So I've got to the important bit, Deb. So, um, uh, so that's... So uh, this is my pass out parade, my photograph there with my sister and my, uh, my, my nephew. Uh, this was taken a long time ago. Clearly it was a long time ago because I've got a jawline and a waistline. Uh, some things that disappeared for me from a long, quite a long time ago. Uh, the second photograph, to the, to, then the photograph to the left of the sort of riot scene or the two riot scenes. Um, if you look right in the middle and I can point to you there, that's me. All right, and this is a, I think it was a big um, England-Scotland football game that went a little bit awry in, in, in the 90s. And, and we, we were patrolling, um, uh, patrolling uh, Trafalgar Square. That was part of my, my, my beat as, as such. So, so I did quite a lot of uh, riot stuff when, when I was much younger, much fitter, and much more engaged in that sort of stuff. And uh, about five or six times I've been in riot situations. Um, that one on the left, is to do with, uh, it was originally uh, what they called the Liverpool Dockers March, and protesting about the, um, the sort of, uh, they, they basically made a whole load of Dockers redundant, um, but it got taken over and because they put their march passed through quite, quite um, peacefully. Um, but unfortunately there was uh, quite a few people afterwards uh, that were intent on causing trouble. Uh, and so we had a, one of these sort of riot situations. So I was in sort of riot situations about three or four times on the bottom left, on the sort of the mid left, you could see the bus that's um, that there detonated. We'll talk about that more in full in a couple of minutes' time. But that's an event that changed my life. All right, the whole event, this 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 bit here, that point to there, without being present in that event, I would not be standing here today uh, because my career and my life took a different change because I was too close to that. Uh, um, but we'll definitely talk about that. You can see the young lady, um, the picture of the young lady. Um, that is Elizabeth Stacy. Uh, I became a detective around about 1999. Uh, and in fact, I can tell you, my first day on the Central Murder Squad for London was the 2nd of November, 1999, um, also my birthday. Um, and I walked in at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, at five past nine, I was on the way up to the University of Westminster in Regent Square or Reed, um, Regent Street, uh, just up from Oxford Street. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Elizabeth Stacey, who was a research assistant from the University uh, of Westminster in the psychology department, uh, one of the mature uh, students there, um, he had uh, gone all, basically done all his qualifications. He's done his, he was a, a fully qualified psychiatrist um, but he didn't, he had really poor people skills, really bad, and they were never going to let him out uh, loose with, with, with the public. So he was never going to achieve his aim of being a psychiatrist. So he decided that he was going to kill himself. Uh, but he didn't know anyone in heaven. Um, he didn't know anyone there. And poor old Elizabeth had been really friendly to him, really pleasant, really supportive to, to him. Uh, and so on the Friday night, uh, she was working late. And unfortunately, he, he beat her to death in the university and her body wasn't discovered to the next day. Obviously uh, her parents were going, um, you know, going mental overnight, trying to hide and find him. He was then going to kill himself, but he didn't kill himself. We found him 10 days later in, 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 in Brighton. And that was the first of my experiences on, uh, on the, the murder command. Obviously in London, we're pretty busy. Um, and certainly, certainly I was central and, and West London was the area that we covered. So we, so we were we were very busy in that in that respect. Does anyone recognise a picture of in the military individual on the in the bottom left? You know, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's General Galtieri. No, it's not. 
<laughs> no, it's General Pinochet. Exactly. It's not General Gatchet. General Gatchet is the, yes, my apologies. General Gatchet is the Argentinian. General Pinochet was the Chilean leader. Okay. He took over the country uh, in a sort of almost peaceful coup uh, and then unfortunately became quite, um, quite tyrannical and ended up with three or four thousand people uh, just being murdered by his, on, on his, his orders. Uh, and he imposed this really rigid uh, state, uh, military state there. And it was, it was, it was, it was very difficult for Chileans. Um, he was overthrown eventually, but allowed to carry on living in Chile. He came to the UK uh, when he was uh, receiving hospital treatment. Uh, Chile is very much affiliated with Spain. In Spain, a magistrate issued a warrant for his arrest. I was on duty that day. And the chief superintendent who was in charge of the um, in charge of the station that I was at said, have you can you drive a car? I've, I've got, have, are you trained to drive a police car, you know, and blue lights and two turns? And that's that. I said, yes, governor. He said, great. We're going up to Harley Street. So we drove up to Harley Street. I had no clue what we're going up. They said, oh, I've got this arrest warrant. It's for General Pinochet. And those times we knew who General Pinochet was. Um, so we walked into this extremely plush. Uh, hospital, very plush, like a five-star hotel, up to the sixth floor. And um, the staff said, you can't come in, you can't come in. And obviously, we were in full uniform in those days. Um, so my boss said, yeah, we're coming in. We've got a warrant, but you, you can't stop us. We then got to the door of, of his the room that he was in, very frustrated. And there was quite a few of the Chilean sort of guards there, Secret Service, who, who were quite physical, said, you're not coming in. So we pushed past them and we walked in and General Pinochet was lying on a bed and it was like that scene from a movie. I can still remember it quite, um, quite well. And uh, it was dark all around him and he had lights, lights on, on his bed. He was not well, he, he was suffering from uh, some kind of um, stomach in, uh, injury, uh, stomach condition. Uh, he wasn't well there. And, uh, and my boss turned around and said to me, well, you better arrest him then, Miles. And I had to end up arresting him for genocide. Now, genocide is a huge, huge thing. So I'm like literally, I think, a handful of police officers that have, that have arrested someone for, for that. Now, when, um, when, they, so when we're in this room, very, very quickly, the, the, the Secret Service from Chile sort of started filling up the area and it became quite, quite uh, typical for us to, to remain in that room. He wasn't going to go anywhere. So my boss called for, for backup. These guys were quite clearly armed as well because they were a diplomatic group from the, from the Chilean embassy uh, and it was getting a little bit tense in there. So what we did was we, um, we left the area, uh, waited downstairs and, um, and you know, um, waited for our armed guards to come along and they then cleared the area out. And then he, he was there, kept incarcerated in the hospital for quite a few times. He never served a day in uh, a, a British jail, unfortunately. He was taken to a custody suite, um, but he was only there for a couple of hours and he spent most of the time on bail at a luxury golf state um, down, in, down in Surrey. Uh, and when he was eventually released, um, and he was very, very close friends with Margaret Thatcher, who was an influential popular um, politician at that time. And without a shadow of a doubt, she got involved uh, with, with that decision making. You can see the uh, sort of building there as well. Does anyone, this, this photograph here of someone clearly falling from, from a, a building, does anyone know where that photograph's taken? Any idea? It's 9 11. Okay. So uh, I was, by this time, I was on the murder command at that time uh, in the United Kingdom, and this is a theme throughout, uh, throughout this talk. If someone dies in the United Kingdom, there is always an inquiry. If they die of natural causes, or there's a uh, sort of violent re uh, sort of reason for, for, for their death. And it's extended a lot of times to British nationals abroad. Uh, <clears throat> so if you die in your hospital bed, there is usually a doctor that's no, can diagnose the reason why you've died. If a doctor's seen you within 14 days, it's just a paperwork exercise. But if it's, it's been, they've not seen a doctor for 14, in those preceding 14 days, it then goes to the coroner and the coroner will establish a cause of death. Now in this system, in this, um, I'll talk about coroners later on. On this occasion, what happened was, is that there was a, 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 a man, a British national had called up and he had called his wife and said, it's on fire 
I'm not staying in and I'm jumping out the window. So he, he put the phone down and he was never heard from again. So it was decided that we would try and identify him for the coroner's court because the coroner decided that he was going to investigate every single one of those deaths and find out where they died, how they died, why they died. Okay. So for two weeks solid, three or four of us sat in a room and watched video after video after video of people that A, were falling or B, had, had landed. All right. So that's the kind of detail that, that British policing goes into to establish the death. Um, and we, we managed to find him eventually. That's not him, by the way. Uh, but we did manage to find him and had, find his identity, and we worked out where he was because the, the building collapsed on top of, of where most of them most of them landed. They landed on a on an atrium, uh, a, 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 um, a sloping atrium, uh, which was quite enforced glass. Um, so, and and there was a lot more than you thought. There was up to about twenty or thirty people decided to go out through the window. So we got involved in that. Uh, the other things I got involved was, you can see the pictures of, of the sort of um, the, 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 the water scene there, um, the, the, the um, wreckage there as well, and a gentleman walking along the beach. I'll talk all about that later, but essentially that's the tsunami. Uh, and then it's the bombing in Brussels uh, in the, on the metro, which I was involved in as well. And then also um, the attack in Seuss, which I'll talk about in detail later on as well. You see the prison intelligence thing. This uh, was my prim primary function. I was always involved in um, sort of covert policing from sort of 1996 onwards. Um, uh, and so for the last sort of 10, 15 years of my career, I was working in the prison intelligence on the covert side of, of, of things operationally uh, with that, which was very interesting. And I got to go all over the country. And sometimes I did manage to get myself on foreign trips abroad as well. So, but my secondary duty was all about family liaison, and I'm going on to talk to you about that later on as well. Any questions? No? So, are all these pictures related to your three active lives? Yeah, they're, 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 that's my police career. Apart from one, what's the question? What's the picture that's not related to my? The dog. Why is the dog there? Okay. The dog, that's my dog. All right, that's my little Lizzie. That's when she was a puppy, she's five now. All right. The dog is there to emphasize to you to never be afraid to ask questions. Ever. Okay. Right. Every one of you was looking at going, what the hell's the dog there for? All right. No one was asking about General Galtieri. <laughs> Not General Galtieri, General Pinochet, sorry. <laughs> General Pinochet. No one was thinking, oh, it's General Pinochet. No one was talking about that, you know. But all of you were looking at the dog going, what's the dog there for? And that's the first sort of thing I want to talk to you about. First thing I want to sort of press upon you today, never, ever be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Only a stupid answer. Okay? All right? You never be afraid to do that. Uh, because I guarantee every one of you looked at that dog. But none of you said, why is the dog there? If you had, I'd have given you some sweets, but I'm going to eat them myself now. Okay, so that's, that's me basically in, in a nutshell. This is what we're going to talk to you today about. Um, as I say, I've had to change it slightly uh, for, for the audience that we've got today. Uh, I'm going to look about crisis uh, as on decision making. I'm going to tell you about some decisions that were made whilst we we're in crisis. Um, I'm going to put you into um, sort of give you a little bit of uh, insight into stress and trauma. And again, it's, it's a sort of low level from my point of view, stress and trauma. Obviously, that's something that's um, that's that's been greatly uh, sort of impacted my, my career and, and, and that thing. So I, I want you to be having awareness of, of that as well. And the reason why I want you to do that. Just go ahead, please. Okay. Okay, and the reason why I want you to have that as well is because you are all potentially senior leaders, leaders in, in business, whatever field you choose to go in later on, all right, you are going to be, be leaders. Um, and notice I say leaders, not managers, because there is a difference as well. Okay, but that's for another topic. Right? I prefer leaders to managers. Now, um, the whole point of this is to give you an awareness of 
what happens to people when they are in crisis. It's all about crisis, okay? Not the moment Monday to Friday. This is all about when it is going a little bit wrong. All right, so the whole point of this, this sort of next hour and a half is to talk about how people react uh, through crisis. We're going to examine some decisions that, 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 that were made uh, and um, ask you whether they were made right or wrong, and then we're going to put some context on that. And we're going to talk about the family liaison officer, the FLO. That's something that I was. I was one of the first family liaison officers in 19, well, about 2002, 2003. I became an FLO when there wasn't. Um, so um, uh, that's a specific role. I'll go through that briefly, what that is and why we do it and why it's unique to, to police. I'll talk about the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, who are now the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. So the, the, the dean is in there. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll talk about how they react as well. Uh, and then we'll talk about, so we'll break it into, uh, we'll have a little bit of a break then, and then we'll do a, a resume of what happened to me when I went to Seuss almost 10 years ago, uh, when I took a team of, uh, of family liaison officers to a terror attack in Tunisia, where 38 people were killed, and then what we, and all the problems that we dealt with on that, that day. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap it up with a bit of an overview of stress and trauma, where I'll try and explain to you the difference between stress and the difference between trauma, and how to recognise it, not only in yourself, but primarily in the people that you work with, the people that you lead. Okay, so I'll be giving you a sort of a quick, non-professional, because I am not a, a, a psychiatrist or I'm not trained in that, but just from my own personal uh, views from leading teams in crisis. Okay, so the first thing we should do really is talk about, oh yeah, health worries. Um, so, I think, I think that in, over the next half an hour, over the next sort of, sort of hour and a half, we're going to be talking about incidents where close to 250,000 people died. I don't know if any of you were in Tunisia or in Thailand or those sort of places where, where I'm going to talk about. I don't know if any of you have suffered bereavement at all recently or in the past that's still having an effect on me. Um, if I say something that is upsetting to you, or if you think you're going to be upset, I won't take it personally if you leave. All right, please don't, don't, I, I, I would admire your bravery. Okay, so please don't, 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 um, don't, don't think I'll be, be offended. I would understand completely. Now, there are photographs later on uh, that we, we show, uh, or every photograph that is on there, I've got from Google. Um, they're, not, they're not too bad. I've shown this dozens and dozens of times around the university, but if that upsets you, uh, and you want to leave, that's fine. If it upsets you and you want to talk to me afterwards, please do that, all right? And we'll go through it and we'll have a chat and get that right there. All right, if anything of this upsets you, make sure you come and speak to me, okay? Right, crisis. So, does anyone know the definition of crisis? Yeah. You're a clever one, you, aren't you? <laughs> That's the dictionary definition. Is there any other sort of definition? Now, you will go to companies where they react um, um, to crisis. So there, there, there would be different kinds of crises. There could be a business resilience crisis. There could be a resource crisis. There could be all kinds of crises uh, that they, they define them. Your average police officer throughout a 30 year career deals with nearly 700 crises of, you know, a time of intense difficulty or danger, predominantly someone else's crisis, all right? How about your average person? How many are they dealing with? About 10, if you're really unlucky, all right? And that's primarily bereavement, unfortunately, okay? That's primarily bereavement or divorce, or financial issues. That's the prime, that's the primary thing for, for, for that, for those people. You as business leaders will probably have a little bit more than those 10 in front. All right, so this is the, the when it starts going through this, my, my definition of crisis is, if you think it's a crisis, it's a crisis, all right? Until someone turns up, let's say either gets paid more than you, or you has been in the job longer than you, and says, nah, that's not crisis, all right? If it's your crisis, if you are in a crisis mode, all right, it's important that you sort of accept what is going to happen to you, all right, and not worry about definitions, all right, deal with it as, 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 as such. So, picture on the left, 1037, 18th February, 1996, in the evening, Sunday evening, 
an event that changed my life. And as I said, without this, I wouldn't be here. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. Uh, I was a uniform officer, loved uniform, loved driving the cars really quickly on the wrong side of the road down the west end of London. Loved all the sort of, all the hassle that, you know, that a young, I was 25, 26 years old, really, really enjoyed being, being a police officer down, down in, in central London. Sunday evening, I was driving the station van. The shift system worked uh, from half past two to half past 10. That was a late turn on a Sunday. Right. A late turn for me as a van driver was two to 10. So I covered the entire West End. So I covered Leicester Square, Covent Garden, Trafalgar Square, just one bloke in a van All right, for that half an hour whilst the teams were swapping over. All right, so we would do that. And in return, what happened is I would finish at 10 o'clock. In the old days in the United Kingdom, and this is 1996, remember, the pubs shut at half past 10 on a Sunday. Shut. By 22.11, you had to be out off the street. You had to be out of the pub. It used to shut down. Now, I'd met a friend in Leicester Square when I was driving the van uh, from my Air Force days, and uh, we'd arranged to meet, we met in a pub on the Strand. So I managed to get there about five past ten past uh, ten, all right, and at 10.37, I stepped out of the pub and I turned right. Now, if you look at this street here, if you can imagine the bottom left corner, this is the old witch uh, there, if you imagine the bottom left there on it, it goes down and then it goes round to the right into the Strand, which eventually leads down to Trafalgar Square. Now, I was walking down, uh, down that street. I came out of the pub and I got about three or four steps. And what happened was is I, I was a big lad then, not as big as I am now, but I was a big lad then. And there was this massive explosion and it felt like someone had punched me in my back and basically lifted me about, it took, took me about 15, 20 feet. So I ended up in the doorway of, uh, of a building society on, on the strand there. And there was a load of glass, a load of glass came flying across. I was like, oh, right. I landed on top of my friend. Um, and it's a good job we landed in that doorway because the person um, that was behind us got quite, quite cut up with all the flying glass that hit her full on, basically. Uh, and she, she wasn't, she was minor injuries, but she was a lot of cuts. I had nothing, nothing. I'm the only police officer on the stage here. So I get up and think, right, I've got to do something. So I run round the corner, leave my friend there. I run round the corner and I'm in touch with, I see this sign here, uh, this site here. Uh, the London bus is um, parking, heading up towards um, the Royal Courts of, of, of Justice. Uh, and I had seen that bus come across Waterloo Bridge. As I came out of the pub, I saw it to, to, to me there. Now, I got to, um, this side of the bus, the left-hand side of the bus, as you're looking looking at it now, and it looked like a big bite mark had been taken out of, 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 the, of, of the bus. Now, there was a, 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 a terror organisation, an Irish terror organisation called the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, who were conducting uh, bomb attacks throughout, um, throughout uh, the UK uh, at that time, that time, and it was a particularly sort of prevalent time. There was, there was quite a few that happened in 1996, 1995, uh, and it all stopped hopefully uh, back for the good in 1998 when there was a peace accord, uh, 1997, 1998, when the Good Friday uh, Accord was signed. But at this time, there was quite a lot of bombings going on. Um, I got to this, so I knew it was, a, it was an IRA bomb. Uh, I'd been to three or four bomb scenes before, but I knew that this, this is the closest I've got that had actually affected me. Um, it looked to me like a big bike mark had been taken out, and there was a guy lying on the floor right next to, right next to me there. So I'm trained, and I've been in the police for five years there. Um, you know, I think I'm, a, I'm an alpha male at this time. I wasn't at 10.38. All right, 10.37, I was an alpha male. I wasn't at 10.38. I got this guy, and I thought, right, I know what I'm doing. So I flipped him on his side, put him into, into the recovery position, uh, he was unconscious, but he was he was breathing. Managed to get him sorted like that. I noticed there was a gun to his to his right, and as I'm on the floor, over my right shoulder, literally here where this uh, where this speaker is, um, I see um, a body. All right, and what happened was um, it was on the back where the door was. It was on the seat that would open up to the the, the side door for, for for the bus, and this guy had. Um, most of his legs had been blown away. Uh, it was marked black, burnt all around the top, eyes wide open, uh, 
clearly dead. Clearly dead. So I thought, nothing I can do for him. All right, this guy's, um, this guy is, uh, I put him in the recovery program. Now you might see on this photograph on the left-hand side, there's a telephone box there. In those days, we used to have telephone boxes everywhere because we didn't have mobile phones. But that was 20 yards from a bomb explosion. All right, so it completely obliterated. So there was no way of telling my colleagues who were literally five minutes down the line that there was, there had been a bomb attack. But what there was, was, was a bloke who had a mobile phone, one of the pair, and it was huge, this mobile phone, quite big, but he couldn't press 999, right? He couldn't, he couldn't, his hand was shaking so much that he couldn't press 999. So I took the phone off him and I pressed 999 and I very calmly called the police and told them exactly what happened. I say very calmly because I thought I was being very calm. I subsequently listened to the, uh, the tape of that uh, conversation and I'm shouting. I'm, I'm getting everything out, but I'm, I'm shouting. And not only am I shouting, but I'm repeating things three or four times. I am by no way calm. Uh, I am proper flapping, as they call this. All right, my, I've, it's gone, I've gone. I'm doing everything I should because the train has kicked in and I was born to be a cop. I, I, know, I know, you know, that's what I've always wanted to do. So I, I, I'm doing everything I should do, but I'm doing it in not the way that I should do, if you, if you get what I, what I mean, because I've completely and utterly lost it. I get in, um, I think to myself, right, they're definitely going to be a bus driver on. So what I do was, and I don't know why, to this day I still don't know why, um, I get into the bus. Okay, I check to see if this guy's dead. Clearly he's dead. He's got no, his, his lower half of his torso is, is missing, but I check anyway. I then go all over the, the, the you know, the, there's a lot of rubbish. As you can see, it, it's not a clean, uh, it's not a clean site at all. So I'm, I'm fighting my way through the, all this rubbish. I get to the chair, the drive where the driver is, uh, and the driver's not there. The chair is, and I can, I can still picture this, it's a tartan seat, okay? The chair's there, but he's not. So my head goes, Phew. He's blown to pieces. He's gone. He's gone. So then I start trying to get upstairs and see if any people are, are there. And then I hear the police, the police turn up. He hadn't actually blown. He hadn't actually gone. What happened was he had been out the window and he'd been blown up and he landed by the white van. Do you see the white van there? So where, fortunately, a nurse, thank God there were always nurses nine times a ten. All right, they turn out where a nurse found him. She was much better than I was. She wasn't flapping at all. All right. She effectively saved this guy's life on the street using her, the, the skills that she had, what she had with her on that, at that time. All right. And I learned so much in that brief five minutes. I learned so much. I then came, my colleagues from this, my sister team who took over from us turned up and they said, all right, go back to the Nick, then the police station. Nick's a, a slang word we use for, for, for a police station. It's a five minute walk took me 25 minutes to get there. I went missing for 25 minutes. Because they know, because on the radio log, they say, yeah, my, uh, 245 was my shoulder number. 245 is on his way back. Okay, 25 minutes, I've gone missing. They're starting to put, find people looking for me. I have no clue where I am. I don't know what happened those 25 minutes. It's all a blur. Still don't know what happened. I've got a vague so there, yeah. So I did a lot, a lot of reflecting. See you later. Thanks very much. <laughs> I did an awful lot of reflecting uh, in this, in that, after this, this event. This was the first big crisis for me. Everything had been dealt with before that. I was very confident before this, very confident. I was out in the streets. I was a good street cop. I was a busy street cop. Um, I still was, became <laughs> a busy, I was still confident in, my, in myself but I'd been found wanting in that respect. I'd done everything right, but not in the way that I should have done. I don't think I was as professional as I was. I don't think I was as calm as I was. So I began chasing these things. Uh, and for the next 30 years, when it was all going wrong, I wanted to be there uh, because I wanted to do it better than when I first did it the first time. Does that make sense? If I'm going too quick, by the way, or, uh, you know, if I'm, I, 
um, colloquialism is going to kick in. Tell me, please. Just tell me. Oh, so, good. so that is um, that is a, a crisis on a national level. This is right in the heart of theatre land. So all the theatres were shut. All right, around there. Can you imagine the amount of tourists that come to London to go to the theatre to 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 watch the shows and there. They were shut for four days. It was entirely shut down. Uh, this was in those days a main thoroughfare that linking the north and the south of uh, south of London. That was shut. Big hotel, Strand Palace Hotel, is just beyond the white building there, uh, the white van there. That was shut. All the businesses around it, all shut. These are banks. On the top of these, these on top on the first floors there, you can see they're banks principal financial businesses, but the, the, the city is literally half a mile away. And these are where a lot of their um, crisis rooms were, were both shut. Massive crisis, four days, uh, caused by this one. But what happened was, it's the guy that was, was uh, had his uh, legs blown off, was um, had been carrying the bomb, and we think the intention was to put it in the Royal Courts of Justice, which were just around the corner from, from that. But as he came down the stairs, it blown up. And unfortunately, and, and, and killed him. The guy that was in the um, in the um, uh, in the bite mark. Remember, I put him in the recovery position with the gun. Uh, he was also an Irish citizen, but they couldn't prove a link between the two. Between the two, it, it seems that this poor guy had just um, been been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And sadly, about five years later, he took his own life. He was twenty three years old when this happened, and he took his own life five years later. So that's, in every intensive person, that is a definition of crisis, right? So the next thing you'll see is 27, you'll see the picture on the, on the, on the right there, is my father. So uh, that's my hero. That's my role model. I'm not ashamed to say it. My missus says to me, oh, you're just like your dad. Couldn't give me a better compliment. Couldn't do it. All right? So he's the man that I looked up to all the time. He, uh, you know, if, if, if I was half as good a dad as was to my daughter as he was to me, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, then he died. And he died when I was 52. He was 80, nearly 86. People die. No, mate. He had his time. And I knew he was going to die. Uh, I didn't know he was going to die that night because unfortunately he died on his own, but he did. But he did die. And we dealt with it. I'm, I'm now, by this time, I'm very project focused. I deal with the issue. All right, I turn everything into a project, all right, and I deal with the issue. So let's get in, let's get the funeral sorted out. That was my project. I dealt with that, right, which I do. My sister told me this. I just that's, I've got to do this. Right, that's what I'm going to do. So I did. I dealt with the project. Let's deal with this state. That's what I did, because that's the problem that I've got to solve. All right. What I didn't deal with was my internal trauma. And they would come, I used to spend an awful lot of time in the car. So uh, I worked in London and for the last sort of 10 years, my partner lives in, in Leeds. So I would be driving up and down the M1 quite a lot. And I would be finding myself, big tough guy, you know, I was 52 by this time. I was coming to, I was in the last six months of my career. Um, and I was just crying, just well enough, not full on sobbing, but for no reason whatsoever. I would do that. So I had to deal with that issue. I had to accept that that's what happened. That was grief. And we'll talk a bit about grief towards the end of this. Okay. So that was a major, major um, sort of crisis for me. My family. Didn't affect anyone else. Didn't affect anyone. You know, but it's a crisis for me. So whilst it's easy to say, okay, <laughs> that's the definition of crisis, a tense difficulty addition. Clearly, that's a crisis. Clearly, this on the left-hand side with the massive bomb, that's a crisis, all right? But that's also an individual crisis for me. For a couple of months, I probably wasn't as good as my job that I should have been, all right? Because I had this thing in the back of my head. That, oh, I used to tell my dad everything. All right? Even in my 50s, I would say, oh, I did this today, dad, did that today. I couldn't do that anymore. I had no one to tell that to. So I lost that huge side of, of, of my life. So I had to deal with that as well. All right. So crisis is different for every other people. Now remember that because when I talked about stress, you might get stressed about something that you don't get stressed about. So it's it's really important that we know that there are differences. Okay. 
Right, I'll quickly run over this. 2000, and I've gone up to the murder squad. I've dealt with Elizabeth Stacey. My prime job there was intelligence handling. Mm -hmm. All right, I did all the covert jobs. I dealt with the informants. I did all the surveillance, was part of the team that did surveillance. Uh, anything that was a technical side, if we had to track a vehicle, I was involved in doing that. And that was my speciality for most of my career. But Stephen Lawrence is a young guy, gets off the bus with his mate, Dwayne Brooks, in uh, 22nd of April, 1993, in Eltham, South London. Now, I don't know if any of you know London, but Eltham is the bottom right-hand corner. As you, if you look down on it, it's the bottom right-hand corner. Now, in the 90s, um, in the 80s and the 90s, it is quite well known as a place, it's a very white area. It's quite well known as an area where all the old school crime gangs, um, have you ever seen, did anyone heard of the Craze? Um, the Craze, if you see, there's a film, uh, Tom Hardy did this massive film where he played the Craze to, the Cray twins. Um, they were big time gangsters, traditional gangsters in the 60s and the 70s. All right, and they ran London with other families called the Richardson family, that sort of stuff. And most of them without, sort of moved down to Eltham and it was a very, very white a little enclave. But this is a diverse London. So in the, 19, in the 90s, people were moving in there of, 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 of colour. Uh, poor old Stephen gets off a bus and unfortunately hits five suspects or meets five suspects who produced to, to beat him to death. Um, <clears throat> this is a job that changed policing, British policing. It was a rubbish investigation, really, really poor. No element of it was successful. They didn't get a prosecution. Uh, to be fair to them, there was, it would became a wall of silence down there. No one would say anything. Even though informants had told the investigation team what was going on and who did it, they didn't do anything with that information. All right. Um, so throughout this entire sort of inquiry, throughout this entire sort of dealing with, uh, with, these, inquiry, with these suspects, people were arrested. Uh, there was a private prosecution, but basically um, they were let down by the police in, in, in many, many all right. And so significant learning came out of, out of it for the police. One of the things is uh, the double jeopardy rule for, for, for murder. So in the old days, if you were taken um, to court to try for murder, if you were found not guilty, uh, that was it. If the day after you were found not guilty, a video had turned up of you actually doing the stabbing or the murder or whatever, it was irrelevant. It didn't matter. You'd gone through the court of law. That was it. The day ended that, 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 that the court ended that day, and that was it as far as the law was concerned. They changed it later on for double jeopardy for murder because the five people had been through a private prosecution and more evidence came, came along a light. So they changed the rules uh, now in place now. So two out of the five are now um, in prison, but that's 2012 they went in, which is, you know, it's nearly 20 years after the, after the offense. But one of the things was a big problem. So, um, sorry, in 1998, um, it was so sort of become such a political hot potato and the, and the outcry to, about the police's action had become so bad, bad that the government created this government commission led by um, Lord McPherson. And he did an inquiry, a public inquiry, uh, where he, he found that the Metropolitan Police were institutionally racist at, at, at the time. Uh, there was a whole host of problems, and one of that was the briefing between the families and the investigation team. In the old days, the investigation team were like black holes. They would take all the information, but they wouldn't give anything back. So he decided that we should have more open and honest, transparent investigation. Um, and murder squads changed like that. People like me ended up going, I would have never, with less than 10 years service, been on a murder squad. But they came to me and said, because I was an intelligence unit by that time, they, they came to me and said, um, do you want to come and join our new murder squad? And I looked at them and going, yeah. <laughs> but it was that they changed the whole culture almost overnight of, of, murder, of murder squads. Got rid of a lot of the old white males that were dominating it. Um, they got rid of a load of those and made it as diverse as they possibly could. And it's nowhere near as diverse as it should be, but it's, it's getting there. So... Um, they then started a role called FLOs, family liaison. You'll hear me talking about family liaison quite a lot. And I was one of the first people that went on the family liaison course, family liaison course. And it all came about because of the, uh, the murder of Stephen Lawrence. This is unique to British policing. 
They do a little bit of it in Australia. They, do, they don't do any of it in America. They do a little bit of it in Belgium. All right. But this is unique to British policing. If you are um, in the UK and your your one of your loved ones uh, dies in a murder, manslaughter, it's now been extended to road traffic or a mass casualty disaster, you get a family liaison officer. And it's usually, as it says there, a detective constable. So the bottom rung. So it's always one of the, the, the detective constables who will become will develop an immersive role with you. You can see at the top there, it says it's an over investigator to support the senior investigating officer, SIO is senior investigating officer. Now, the reason why it's over is because if FLO will never do anything, they never put bugs in your house, they never lie to the, to the, to the family that they are dealing with. They do, that, that's really important to, 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 the, to the role and it's really important that the families know that as well, because sometimes you are dealing with uh, criminality, criminal criminals who have lost their lives, and we're dealing with a criminal family who are fully aware and actually engaging in that criminality a, as well. Right? And it might be that they've been taken out by another opposing gang. Right? They need to know that they're getting the information and that that, and that officer is not conspiring against them. All right, so that's why it, it's over. That's why it's a detective, because the detective is sitting there going, I think you probably know more than you should. A lot of times the family know what actually went on because they hear it from various other sources outside outside policing. So they can feed that back through into through to the family liaison officer if they've worked up a really good relationship, which it should be. Um, and uh, it has worked so well. In fact, in, in these days where they've cut policing to the core, what they have done is increase family liaison. Right, the family liaison officers, uh, are, are, they're all over the place now, fortunately. And I was one of the first. You can see there, um, they, they gather evidence from them in a way that contributes to the investigation. Up on the top right on the second um, par paragraph, the second sort of column, you'll see anti-mortem data, DVI, which is um, disaster victim identification. That's something that the family liaison, uh, family liaison officer deals with, and I'll talk about that later on as well. But they are regularly, they, are, they become the mouthpiece for the family. They're the ones that say, well, right, what are your concerns? What do you want us to do? Is there anything that is really bugging you? And they'll go back to the investigation team and try and find an answer and then take it back to, to, the, to, to the family. So they are the one single point of contact. So the message that is flowing comes from one person, as opposed to numerous sources. Communication is a huge problem during, <clears throat> during crisis, massive problem, because too many people with voices are involved. All right? Cut the chatter. Cut out all that white noise around. All right, get the communication flowing better and the crisis will be managed a whole lot easier. Get a, get a command structure in place if you have to. That's what we do in the, in the police. We get a gold, silver, bronze command, but we've got three levels of management. All right, we've got the gold making the ultimate decision, silver managing the strategy from, from, um, from, from the gold, and the bronze commands they're the ones that are actually doing the running around. All right, so get that sort of structure in place and reduce the amount of dodgy comms that's coming through. Okay, work out a comm strategy as well because communication is the art of dealing with crisis. Okay, if you manage your comms properly, you'll manage your, your, your crisis better. So you also see that we've got an audio, audit trail. We write everything down. Okay. Does anyone remember the picture I showed you a couple of minutes ago? I, I showed you a picture of my system and I, I told you where it was, where that photograph was taken. Anyone remember? What about the dog? Remember the dog? Remember the dog's name? No. Is he? Oh. You can remember that, don't you? So you remember the dog's name. So what I'm saying is, I told you that Five minutes ago, write things down. Seriously, in community, and when you're in this sort of crisis mode, you're in that kind of write things down. Because six years down the line, when someone who, one of your employees is taking you to court, because <laughs> of something that you said you did on that time, all right, you've got a record, you bring it down, on the day, contemporaneously, they call it, all right? And that is worth the weight in gold. 
to have a day book. You would know, if you see someone carrying this, they are guaranteed to be a police officer, all right? Because they get these for free. Police like free stuff, okay? And they write stuff down in these. These are day books. Most cops, detectives, have one of these. I've got these going back for the last 10 years. I can tell you what I was doing in 2012 by just going through that. I'll tell you what I was thinking in 2012. All right? So write stuff down because it will pay off. It might seem like a pain, but it will pay off in the long run if something goes wrong. If it's, okay? So that's the basic duties of FLO. Secondary to what? So I was, I was in the intelligence world, but when they didn't need me uh, to do any of my sort of intelligence stuff, I became a family liaison officer, so I'll deal with, with, with that. Right. My life then changed again. Sorry. Yeah. No, don't, don't apologize. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Bullet point it. Bullet point it. Yeah. So if I go in to meet you, okay, let's. I'm your family liaison officer and someone near to dear to you. As, as, as that. I will walk into that day and write down what you're wearing. Okay, I'll write down where you were in that room. Only in bullet points, I'll write down what, what time we started talking, where we were, so I'll write that down. And then I will try and remember everything in exchange that was said before between us. If I can get it in direct speech, I'll do that. All right, so what we normally do is we send two family liaison officers. So one is doing the talking, right, and the other one is surreptitiously doing the writing. All right, so that they might, so, so they, 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 they're also identifying any sort of risk factor. So you might something might say something that might pose a risk to the investigation or to the to, to the relationship between us and you. All right. And so we're trying to identify. That's why they're experienced detectives. All right. So they're trying to identify any risk there. And as you go through your career, I'm so risk averse. I if I go into a pub, all right, I will not sit with my back to the door. You can always tell cops. You walk into a pub, all right? The bloke that looks up to you or the lady that looks up to you, cop, put my pension on it, all right? Because they're all, that, that, I'm so risk aware. It drives my missus mental, all right? Because I'm, I, I have to have a look at that. I have to know what's happening towards me. So that's the risk awareness kind of, kind of thing. And by writing it down, there's an old saying in the law, and it's, it's, it comes about from Stephen Lawrence, actually. Uh, Stephen Lawrence, when, when they finally prosecuted the Met, all right, they got a whole load of police officers saying, oh, yeah, we did this, we did that. And the barrister said, OK, where did you write this down? Where did you record it? And oh, we didn't record it. Well, how can you possibly remember what you did five years later? But if you've got it written down, and it's just bullet points, if, you've got, if, if we have a meeting that lasts two hours and I've just got half a page, that now, oh yeah, I can refresh my memory on that. And they cannot complain about the content of those two hours. If I said to you, she said this, she said that, she said that, even if it wasn't recorded in here, because you've got that written down, it, it, it affects your um, ability to sort of recall, okay, positively. The law, the adage in the, in the law is, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. Okay, so, Write it down, record it on your email, send an email to yourself if you have to. All right, do something, but just record it because these things that is the least one, the one that you think is easily solved, the one that you think you've, you've taught, done and dusted, that's the one that'll come back and bite you. All right, so uh, the whole scenario, write down bullet points, but just make sure you record it. Okay, we're uh, just five minutes on the scenario and then we'll, we'll, we'll go. So 2004, slipped through country I'm on a covert. I'm back on a covert room roll. I've left. Um, I've left the murder squad, and I'm working in a covert facility. And I can't go out to meet members of the public because of the role that I was in. Um, Boxing Day, uh, a massive tsunami. An earthquake occurs just north of Banda Aceh in, in, in Indonesia, uh, and unfortunately, uh, overnight, within within an hour of the of, of the earthquake. 125,000 people are dead in, in Indonesia. At the top end there, you can see the, the, this bit here, that's the epicenter, that's Banda Aceh, 
uh, and that unfortunately hits um, it hits the um, that town really really badly. It wipes out most of the population. In there. You can see the photograph there of the lady on the beach. That's a really famous photograph. Uh, you can see the way to, that, that first of all it sucked out. The, the sea was sucked out. Uh, those bizarrely, all those people in that photograph survived um, because. They, she called them that way, so they turned right. You can see they're running across towards the left, towards where the boat is. She's called them, and they run towards her. And behind her, her where these photographs have been taken, is a, an elevated ridge, uh, and they manage to get up on, on there, and their lives are saved. And you can see the impact, but you can also see on the right-hand, top right-hand um, uh, photograph, you can see that people are just looking at this wall of water coming over, um, coming over, on, and they're eventually going to hit them. And you can see in the bottom left hand side, the, the, the devastation is caused. So we were called in uh, to the coordination centre that was running out of North London, uh, Hendon. We just set up this really, really sexy um, sort of casualty bureau. Really spent a lot of money on this. It was a big room, very much like this, and had pods all over the place. And in the corner was a little family liaison pod for that as well. It was designed to answer um, like 10,000 calls a day that could deal with that. With that. Uh, in the first hour, there were 37,000 calls and it collapsed just like that, just went. And we didn't have any resilience, nor did the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Now they've got three crisis centres in two different countries. <laughs> you know, they've got one in the UK, they've got one in Hong Kong, they've got one in Spain. Uh, based on what happened on, on, on that occasion, it collapsed, completely and utterly collapsed. We didn't have any way of recording um, the information that we were getting. So people would ring up if they got through and we would have someone busily saying, well, where are, where is your family member? And you can see there's a huge area and you can also see it's a huge tourist area. Thailand, Sri Lanka uh, goes down the bottom there, even went out all the way to the Maldives, all right? So at some stage, they thought UK Senate, they, had, they thought they had 50,000 people missing. They worked out that they had 50,000 UK citizens in that area, all right? And for about three or four days, no one heard anything from them because the comms were just completely wiped out. So what they did was um, they sent a load of police officers and I, I was dealing with Thailand. All right, I didn't go to Thailand, but they sent a load of police officers to Thailand uh, and they were these disaster victim identification officers that I spoke about earlier, remember, remember those? Uh, and they were basically there to, friend, to identify the individuals uh, and repatriate their, their, their bodies there. So they got to, um, to Bangkok and the infrastructure was so broken down that they had to stay in the hotels for five days. So for five days, the people on the coast here that had been impacted by this were on their own. There was a huge amount of devastation. There was an awful lot of bodies about, unfortunately. So the bodies were picked up originally and they were taken to a temple. So a temple, so uh, it's a, a Buddhist sort of uh, religion in, in, in Thailand and they've got these courtyard temples. So they were putting them very respectfully, put them on, on there. All right, but it's hot. It was in the house summer, it was just Christmas day. This is Boxing Day, this is hot. It's very warm there. They then started putting ice. They've cleared all the bars with the ice making. They're putting ice on the bodies, trying to keep them cool. But obviously the ice disappears within minutes. So they decide, we're going to have to do. Sorry. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Is there a difference between crisis and emergency from sets? There will be. All right. But I go back. To, that's the problem, <laughs> in my eyes, that people make it a little bit more complicated than it should be. My basic understanding is, if it's a crisis, you think it's a crisis, and we go through what I was telling you. It's a crisis. There will be a difference between the two. All right. Now, but emergency management is usually around pre-planned events. It's around being proactive in planning for, you know, for all kinds of scenarios. Whereas this crisis is just responding as, as, as it is. It's a reactive, really. Okay. Anyway, um, where were we? Oh, yeah. So the bodies, so they then decided to take them to the hospital. The hospitals were full. They couldn't take them. Anymore. They were piling up these bodies. So what they did was they dug two holes. So they dug one hole and they put, and excuse my language, might be a bit clumsy, but this is my, <laughs> the way I probably deal with it. Uh, and they put um, the white people in one hole and then they dug another hole and they put the non-white people in that hole as well. 
So now, here, nearly 20 years later, good decision or bad decision? Who thinks it was a good decision? Who thinks it was a bad decision? A little bit, you could turn around and say, it's a little bit racist, isn't it? Why are all the white people in one hole and all the non-white people in another? They were all kind of... I would immediately say, oh, it was, why would they distinguish between people on those grounds? But it kind of makes sense to say that these white people probably weren't from there, so they would need to be identified by... Spot on. About a bag of sweets, I hadn't even you the gone. <laughs> Spot on. All right, first of all, the person that made the decision had been through that. Okay, they'd been through that. Undoubtedly, they would have lost something without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, their decision was those people, Thai culture is very much about guests. Most of Southeast Asia is going to turn out that. Most about, about guests looking after the people that visit their country or looking after people that visit their house. All right, and it's exactly for that reason. They knew the people in that pit were probably going somewhere very quickly. All right. Whereas the people in that pit would be dealt with as and when they can. Because they, they, they knew that there was hundreds of peace officers sitting in, in Bangkok waiting to deal with the people in that pit. Which is a problem because there was quite a few British nationals in, in, in the other pit as well. Because obviously you can't tell what people's nationality is just by looking at them. So anyway, so what happened was, is um, there was this free-for-all. At some stage they said, right, yeah, come and get in. So we, they went along to the pit. This is a collection of police forces, Germans, Australians, Americans, Danes, Japanese, English, they're all there. They went along and they took out the pit and they went, oh yeah, clearly American, fly them back to America, clearly Australian, send them back to Australia. And the problem is when they got to America and Australia, they weren't American, they weren't Australian. All right. So for three days, we had bodies flying all over the country, all over the world. Other countries do coronial processes. I mentioned this. Um, so you go to Australia, they do identification by teeth. So what they do is they cut the jaw off. They don't do it anymore. In those times, they cut the jaw off. All right. So they went, oh, not Australian. There you go. Put the jaw in the coffin, send it back. Goes to England. So we reopen up the coffin. And there's a guy there who's had his jaw, jaw, jaw removed. No reason other than identification. Because that's the process they did in Australia. Germans cut hands off. So the Germans, we would open up, ah, oh, it's from Germany, this one. Well, they thought it was a German. So after three days, this Danish, Danish person stood up, the head of the Danish and said, stop, let's just stop, because this is madness. Very right, so they reenacted what they call the DVI, Disaster Victim Identification Protocol, sent them in, uh, and they, no one was allowed to leave that country until they'd been formally identified. And then what would happen was, is that in the, in the say for instance, there was a British victim that they thought was British victim. In the UK, the family liaison officer would go out, would go to the family and try and get as much identification material as possible. So dentist photographs, that's the best sort of images that you can get, the best sort of thing you can get. If they've got previous convictions, fingerprints is the next bit. And then what's the, the third bit, do you think? Tattoos is really good, visual identification, yeah. But some people might have the same tattoo. Nailed on marker, DNA. They would take DNA samples. Yeah? Yeah, it's expensive. So that's why it's the third option, not the first. <laughs> <laughs> and also it takes, it takes longer, all right? It also causes problems, okay? Why, if we go into a family, and again, crisis is, identifies these problems. If we go into a family and the father says, here's my DNA, take a photo of my hair, what do we say? You're thinking it, aren't you? <laughs> Can we have the mother, please? Can we do it very, because mother is a lot better because 50%, the, the maternal DNA is stronger in all of us, all right? And the other thing is, he might not be the father. And I tell you, that happened in the tsunami. We were dealing with that. Okay, that happened. But the father said, I'll give it. And the mother rang out and said, he's not the father. So we had to meet her quietly in a service station, take her DNA. 
because that's not our that's not our issue. It's not for us to do that. Okay, so it then so we put the brakes on moving people out until that, that that identification took place, and the delay was immense. It took nearly a year to identify. We went through thousands of bodies. So there were families that were waiting for their loved one to be returned that had a family liaison officer with them. And then we were going in there and saying, we haven't got to them yet. We haven't got to them yet. We think we know where they are, all right? Because they were identified, they, they, were, they were all put in um, shipping containers that they put refrigeration into it. But it took nearly a year. Same as Grenfell. Remember Grenfell, the big fire that killed 83 people? It took place four months it took to identify all those people. You are not dead until you're identified. And you pretty much know if they're not there the next day, they're dead. But they weren't formally identified, so they weren't formally dead until that identification took place. Now, is that a good or bad decision? To delay that, to say you're not dead until such time. Yeah. Hold my beer, watch this. So, Laura Whitney. They're part of this big um, uh, uh, sports team, America, in, in uh, Taylor University, Indiana. They're in one of their school bu bu big buses. They're going along the freeway out there, and it gets taken out by one of these big lorries that they have in America. Kills five of them. Laura gets killed. Whitney survives. All right. Intensive care, really bad head, head injuries. Burn victim uh, is put into an induced coma, bandaged up. All right. Laura is taken back to her family, handed it back to her family. Um, they take her back to, to the, the town where, where she was born. Um, they have um, a big memorial service, 1,500 people attend this memorial service. All right. Whitney is dealt with by uh, this hospital. Her family get a rota that they are in that room. Someone is in that room for the entire six weeks that she's kept in, that, in, the, um, in the induced coma. Brother goes in there and is sitting with her and notice that she's got a belly button piercing. Brother says, maybe you wouldn't have a belly button piercing. Goes, says to his mum, got belly button piercing. Mum says, so? We don't know everything. It was very dismissive, dismissive of it. All right? Goes to the hospital administrators and says, mm, I'm a bit worried about this. Hospital administrator says, no, no, we've identified you. It's fine, fine. She's definitely good. Five weeks later, Whitney wakes up. Whitney isn't Whitney. Whitney is Laura. All right. So Whitney had died in real life. All right. Whitney was buried in a grave marked Laura Van Ryan and had been in a funeral with 1,500 mates, 1,500 of her, her colleagues there, with friends. When the reality and um, Whitney's family were actually sitting and getting Laura through. Um, the trauma of that six weeks. So if anything identifies why that identification process does work, it's that. They didn't do it on that occasion, and they should have done it. So the rules are now, if there's three people that dies, all right, it, it's now called a mass casualty event, okay? And if it's three people, the bodies do not leave until that person has been informed of it. They don't leave the custody of them. When you die, what happens to your body in the UK? Who owns your body? state it's true in other cultures it's families in, in us it's the state okay so can we have five minutes do you want a five minute break can we start do we oh is that the time i thought it was three yeah i thought it was three that we yeah it's a shame if we don't have Q&A, so I would hope we're yeah, close by 2.40. Oh. 2.40 and then have Q&A Oh, I thought so it was 2. Your, your last slides are. Oh, uh, you want to go down? Okay, then. Uh, yeah, All right, then. Okay, so, well, tough then. Have a sip of drink. Yeah, have a sip of drink. Are you going to have a break? Yeah, that's my part. I'm okay to carry on. It's them that I'm worried about. Oh, that's fine. I think I've done this. Does anyone want a break? Anyone want to use the loo? Or? Sorry, I thought it was three o'clock to half yeah, three. Yeah, you could do Q&A, no. Oh. One, three, or seven. Oh. Uh, yeah, the other, at the end, it's just for okay. the end of the case. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll quickly go through this. Seuss. 
All right, 2015, I'm now detective sergeant. I'm on cat terrorism kind of a detective sergeant for about 10 years by that time. I've been on cat terrorism kind of for some while, working in prison intelligence. But my secondary duty is family liaison. We'd had attacks in, in Algeria. We'd had attacks in Kenya um, where I dealt with the families but hadn't been allowed to deploy over in the situation, over in the actual scene. And I would be saying, why can't we go? There's all kinds of issues going on in Kenya, all kinds of issues going on in Algeria that, that we could have dealt with um, and we had to deal with them back in the UK, which was not satisfactory. 26th of June, 2015, around midday, the Algerian time, I was in Hemelhunter train station. All right, I got a telephone call. Hemelhunter, just a small town just outside London. All right. And I've bunked off early because it's a Friday and I'm a detective sergeant, so I can do that. All right. And I'm going up north to see um, my partner, Catherine. Telephone call. I look at it and go, oh, God, can I answer it? Because I'm an idiot. I answered it. I didn't get home for three weeks. Okay. That call told me that this attack had happened. All right. So I pretended that I was elsewhere. I managed to jump on the train, get back. No one knew I was in Hamlin, I'm said until that I decided to bunk off early until I left the police. Uh, so we did that, we arrived at, arrived at, um, back, at uh, back at New Scotland Yard at, at this time. And what happened was, is if you look at this, this, um, this map here, uh, you can see at the top is Tunis, you can see there. Tunis is at the top there. Halfway down on the right-hand side um, is uh, Seuss, this sort of around right there, up there. And then there's airport monastery, and Al Hamat, their airports are there. Quick thing about, um, about Tunisia, it's got uh, about 11 million people in it. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of extend south enough for it to get the riches that Algeria and Libya have got from oil. So it relies on tour tourism. Uh, uh, it's a very, very democratic uh, town, a very democratic country. You can't be in power if you're military or religion. Right, you can't be a politician if you're attached to any military or religion parties, you're not part of it. So for that reason, it is often attacked from by ISIS in, in, uh, who are uh, in Libya at the time. All right, so there have been a few attacks in the past in, in there, one in, in Tunis in, a, in a, a museum there that killed 24 people. And on the 26th of, of um, February, on the 26th of June, sorry, 2015, this guy here uh, walks out and, and with his Kleshikov and I execute 38 people, 32 were UK um, citizens. I used to put his name there. There's an excellent organization called Survivors Against Terror, who, uh, who are exactly what they are, Survivors Against Terror. They are family members of people uh, who uh, have lost, who've been lost in, in terror attacks. They are people who have been present in, in terror attacks and they are very, very influential. They say, don't justify his is by putting his name up there. He is inconsequential. He's a terrorist murderer. And you know what? I agree with him now. So anyone who's a murderer, they're just a murderer. They don't deserve a name. All right. So from now on, that from the policy is, is we just refer them as, as a murderer. The worst thing is when they put the word Muslim next to the word terrorist, which is just terrible. And our mainstream media are, are remarkably, and that again is creating a division that ISIS really, really want. All right, so that's a terrible thing to do, and that's something that should be queried. If you ever hear that at all, fortunately, you're all younger. It's my generation that's guilty of that, not yours, thankfully. Okay, my generation needs to learn much from you. All right, so this is the hotel. Sorry about the quality of the picture. Again, I've stolen it from there, but you can see the beach on the bottom on the bottom there. All right, there's about 80 or 90 beds there. It's got a, it's got a cafe, and then the hotel is behind it. There's a, a swimming pool where those trees are, and the big hotel in that, that background there. Okay. He's coming along from, sorry, he's coming along from the beach. So he's coming along. If you're looking at that picture, he's coming along from the, from the, um, the right-hand side uh, and he's starting hitting people, shooting people who are lying on their, on their beds there. Um, he's then gone into the hotel itself. As you can see there, he's walked through to the pool area there. People were looking up going, what's on there? People were, were being killed in the, um, uh, around the pool area. He's then gone up the left hand side. You can see on the picture as you're looking at here, the left hand steps has gone left here. There used to be an, a lady uh, who was a Dutch lady. Uh, she was wheelchair bound. She went to that hotel for about 15, 20 years every summer. And the staff, you were really popular with the staff. They used to wheel her out there, put her under an umbrella, and serve her drinks all day. And she was there quite happily. Uh, she would spend, spend, spend two weeks a year in, uh, in that spot there. That was her spot. All right. 
he shot her in her wheelchair, tipped her out of the wheelchair. They go, if you go along, uh, follow that path along, there's a door, you can't see it, but under, it's underneath to the left of the smaller dome on top of the roof there. They've gone into there and that leads into the swimming pool area, the indoor swimming pool. In there, three generations of, of, of UK family lost their lives. Uh, he's then come out to the right of uh, this picture on the right hand side behind that white um, sort of guard area. The swimming pool is there. He's come out across the car park there. Uh, I knew the security guard that used to sit in the left hand side on the left hand side there. And he'd got a few people that had run from the beach in their swimming costumes. And they were still, they were standing in the car park. He'd come, got there and he gunned them down there. He killed about five or six people in front of my poor security uh, guy. You know, he was a right mess when I, when I, when I got to him a week or so later. Uh, he's then gone back into the, through the doors. He's turned left. There's the reception there. There's a little door by this lady in yellow uh, that's standing there. Over, you can just see the dark door by, in front of her face there. All right, there's a little door there. He's gone into there, leads into a mezzanine, uh, which has got offices off it, no windows. And he's gone up there. Uh, a lot of staff have taken people up there. All right. A lot of the staff have barricaded people into, the, into that area. Uh, there was one room where there was about 35 people barricaded in by Tunisian. All right. And Tunisian stood in front of the door and stopped him from going into, into that room. If they hadn't, they'd have just, you'd just been able to kill those people. Okay. He then comes out, comes back over, comes back down on the right hand side of the, the steps, finishes off our Dutch lady and a Russian guy that was helping her out, unfortunately. Kills her, kills him. He was helping. Then makes his way down out of the out of the um, out of the hotel. Is taken. It goes into a sort of a state, a sort of residential estate on the on the, on the side there. And twenty five minutes later, is killed by Chinese in places. Graphic images. These are all, like I say, from um, from uh, Google. But if you want to shut your eyes now, please do. And I'll tell you when to start. So yeah, as you can see. All the photographs there, top left hand side, you can see that they're all on the beach. These people just had absolutely no chance. They had nowhere to, to, to go. Uh, you can see our top right hand photograph in the swimming pool. That's the feet of our youngest victim, 19 year old Joel. Bottom left is our um, Dutch lady and her, her Russian guy that was trying to help her. The lady in the pink bikini, please remember her. She comes up later on. All right, and that middle picture is, is, uh, is our terrorist. Okay, photographs have gone, so you can look up now. Top left, that's our youngest, Joel. He is 19 years old. The photograph next to him is his uncle, and the photograph next to that is his granddad. He was there with his 16-year-old brother as well. 16-year-old brother survives because Joel gets on top of him and hides him from the bullets. All right, 16-year-old brother rings his mum and says, Mum, your son, well, she Probably used to do either. Your son, your brother, your dad have been killed in the terror attack. Can you imagine getting that phone call? They've gone away on holiday together. All right. So these are the 30 UK nationals that were killed. You can see most of them were, were, were older and you know they didn't get an escape. All right. There were 38 in, in total. The, the UK enacted um, the DVI plan, and that's when I was sent out. So I was sent out on Saturday, um, and I got down to Seuss on the Sunday, by which time all the bodies had been taken up to, 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 to Tunis. So we passed on the motorway, effectively. Um, they, were, um, uh, they were taken to the mortuary, and we were dealing with, with all the people that were left there and the families that, 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 that were coming over. Uh, from, from the UK. So it was decided by the Tunisians that the identification they would do would be physical identification. So if someone came over, they wanted the person to come up to them and physically do the identifications in front of them, you know, to take it back. So what happened then was my FLOs would grab them from the, um, grab them from the, from the, from the airport, because they would come over three planes a day, one at 6.30 in the morning, so that means that an hour and a half, that means we had to get up at four to get there, uh, one at uh, in the afternoon, and then one late in the evening, about 11 o'clock at night, so it was a very, very long day in, in total. They would then take the families up to, to uh, the morgue in, in, uh, in Tunis Hospital, massive hospital, 
This is when I went there. I took this photograph from the right there when I could do hear the, I, the smell. Okay? Because they didn't have the ability to cope with 38 bodies additionally. In Muslim culture, very quickly, the bodies have moved through because the families look after um, the body much more so than we do in the UK. We leave it all to a funeral director and they could be there for weeks, but the families are very, very, very much involved in the, in the culture. But they could not cope with this situation. My family would walk in to this, into, into that building. They were then made to sit in an office and wait until a, a member of the government turned up, said how sorry they were. Um, and then they were, had to go into another room uh, where they had a DNA sample taken from them. I had the, the son-in-law of one of my victims had DNA sample taken from it. There's no way they're not family, they're not related. But despite the fact that we were saying there's no relation, they still took the, the DNA sample from me because that's what they had decided that they were going to do. Good decision, bad decision. They were in crisis, terrible decision. Terrible. No, it doesn't matter. I can't justify that decision at all because it traumatized my, my family. All right, they've then gone in. The next thing they've done is they've gone to, into another room and there's Polaroid, 38 Polaroid photographs of people lying on that table there on the left hand side. All right, and they said, which one's yours? And they basically had to identify that person from there. And then sometimes about an hour, two hours later, they were then in, taken into, into a, a, an identification room where all the other bodies were. So they were walking past 30 other bodies to this one table where the person was. To be fair to Tunisia, it happened to me in Belgium as well when I was in Belgium. Belgium did exactly the same thing. It took us through the morgue where people were doing autopsies to try and get to take us to a um, to, to a chapel of rest where our body was was, was laid. Right? But it was absolutely tra traumatizing. I talk about re-traumatizing. This is re-traumatizing. Okay? This is re-traumatizing. Um, I'm going through this very quickly because we've only got something, but the issues I face is cultural differences. I had a team of four. Two guys were of Muslim uh, descent, two females. The two guys, it was Ramadan, so uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't get any food. That was a big issue. The two guys were observing Ramadan, but they then stepped out of it. You can, in, 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 they told us in, in Muslim culture, you are allowed to step out of it. So they became, because they couldn't effectively work because they wouldn't have been eating or drinking their entire time. So they stepped away from, from, from Ramadan. They didn't observe it during the week that they were there. The two female officers, I used to send them off to police, the police station um, to try and get some information. But because they were women in a small town in Tunisia, where probably it's not really a modern approach, they were disregarded. So my team, of my experience, New Scotland Yard detectives, couldn't get an input from, from them. All right? So I had to decide then to withdraw those, those two, to, and then it ended up me doing it. All right? I, I either fight it, or I just deal with it at the time and solve the problem, which is what I did. So I solved the problem, even though I wasn't comfortable, because the two officers were much more capable than me. All right, so I solved the issue because I then took it over. Right or wrong, it is. Um, communications, I'll mention this briefly. If you are in the UK, you've got this phone with you. It, it, pretty much everywhere you go, you've got a signal. And if you haven't got a signal, it's a major inconvenience, isn't it? All right, over there, the signal was 2G at the time. We were on 4G, but they were 2G, all right? There was just no communication. So I was calling up Tunis. My, 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 I had a team in Tunis. All right, and the, so my, my phone was a UK mobile, it's going off one satellite, bouncing on one satellite, and then ending back in, in, in Tunis. And it was a 30 second delay between my, um, my, me speaking and the other person hearing what I'm saying. Do you remember what I was saying? Comms is key in a crisis. Communication is key in a crisis. In the end, we had to observe radio protocols. So I would say, over. And then I would sit and I would wait. It's kind of an effective conversation like that if you were, if you were doing that. So we had all kinds of issues like, like that. Um, mission creep, I'll mention that quickly. I was the only, I was a senior officer as a detective sergeant. So I was like three ranks. I was like a sergeant, but 
Um, uh, but I was the senior officer in suit in the area itself. My bosses were up in Tunis and they were ringing me up saying, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? So that became what we call mission creep. As a leader, all right, first of all, try and make it limit the mission creep on yourself. If you have got a total role in crisis, try and keep your role to that. Now, as a leader, it's going to be difficult to do that. Okay, you are going to have to have what they call mission creep on it. But try not to involve other people in your mission creep. And I'll, you'll sh sh I'll show you why, why later on, because it reduces the impact of, of, of their efficiency during, during this really important time. Right, pressure from London. Again, that was a huge thing for us. Um, we were having telephone calls from members of the par parliament ringing us up. I mean, they needed to know information left, right and centre. All right. I say this, equate this to a, a, a CEO or a, a, a headquarters like the travel industry. All right. They've got a crisis centre set up um, and they start ringing the people on the ground. And every time they ring the people on the ground, um, that person is being taken away from the job that they're doing because they've got questions. If you train that person on the ground properly, right, they should be able to deal with everything without your constant interfering, without your advice. All right? Never ever fail your staff by not training them because it's, too, it's not cheap enough or it's, you know, it, it's too expensive. If you don't train your staff, you haven't got proper staff. And this is a classic example. All right, so if you want to find out stuff that's coming on, in my case, I had been trained, so I was all right. But I ended up on phone calls, at Cobra calls, they call them, uh, in those days, with, as part of the cabinet. I was ring they were ringing me up, and I was saying, well, this is happening, to the prime minister. All right, so it, we, it came, and I didn't want to get involved in that, because I had my job to do with the family, but I ended up having to do that sort of thing as well. So you have to also be dynamic. <laughs> That's the other thing. I'm, I'm telling you not to do mission creep if you can, but you have to sometimes do that sort of thing. So you have to be dynamic as well during, during, um, during crisis. Right, I'm going to tell you a quick one about, do you remember the lady that is in the pink bikini? Her son um, was a registered sex offender. He'd assaulted someone in a nightclub. Uh, and he'd done three months in prison. He'd come out, he was on a tag. So he had a tag around. So he was on the, on the bail sort of side of things. He was at the end of his, his sentence. He wasn't allowed to leave the town that he was in. So this attack took place on a Friday. He got a special dispensation from the magistrate. And they said, yes, you can leave and go and do that identification process. So he flew over to Seuss with his uncle and his girlfriend. His girlfriend had stuck with him because of, during the sexual assault era, she'd stuck with him. Uncle hated him because he said he thought he was a sex offender. So the uncle had no time. He was only interested in his, uh, in his sister. The guy, the sex offender kid, his dad had died. So within an hour of landing, he was on his way up to Tunis and he had to go through all that identification. So he'd gone through, in, through that trauma as well. He then had to manage that family because the uncle hated him. Uh, the girlfriend was really, really wavy. You can understand that, understand that way. Her mother, the mother who survived, um, she wasn't expected to save the, save the night, to survive the night, so we took them into the, into the hospital. They stayed the night. After he'd done the identification, stayed the night, we stayed with them. Um, she was taking them back to the UK. They'd taken three bullets out of her. In the UK, they found another two. All right. So again, to be fair to the Tunisians, they didn't have what they call the MRI scans. They put through this lady through the MRI scan and, 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 and did that. But what I'm trying to say is here, there's no such thing as a happy family. <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect family. That's a better way to do it. All right, it's chaos and confusion, especially in times of crisis. And accept that and deal with it. Uh, deal with it. Uh, um, Theresa May, she was the Home Secretary at the time. She turned up. This is what I talk about when you're a leader. She was not a leader on this occasion. She turned up, uh, got a photograph taken on the beach, all right, uh, and did nothing other than that. Uh, senior politician, the Home Secretary, number, number three in the government, all right, but she turned up. Uh, in that time, all the staff were all concentrating on her, and the only people that were concentrating on the families were my, me and my three staff. 
So her management decision, her management, her decision to do that, completely impacted on 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 the, the effectiveness of, of our operation. I could go on most, you know, for another hour. What are the issues that we had, including me almost having to stand up fight from that King to be tone. Uh, I'll talk to you about the media briefly. Brilliant most of the time. When they're bad, they're really bad. They cause you unbearable because they get the story from their point of view. We were in, remember I told you about the comms, we had a Skype at 11 o'clock at night with, and the only place that we could do it was in the main reception of this hotel. So there's eight or nine of us in the reception of this hotel, huge, it was about the size of this reception area, about the size of this whole area. And we were sitting there waiting for the Skype and we had soft drinks because we were still going to work and then we were going to work, work the next morning. So we, we were surviving on our four or five hours sleep and the photographs were taken of us sitting there with drink. So I went over with the team leader from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to the bloke who take the photograph and I explained to him exactly what happened. The bloke who take the, 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 the Foreign Commonwealth guy wanted to rip his head off, all right, because he was absolutely furious that that photograph didn't represent what it looked like. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I'm saying media are brilliant, but they've got their own agenda. And their agenda is to make you, <laughs> as the establishment, look bad. So bear that in mind. Quick one about absorption before I move on to the, the main thing. So last sort of day, Friday, well, I didn't know it was gonna be the last day. I'm doing the 5.30, I've been up since 4.30, I hadn't got to bed since until two this morning. This is on Friday, almost a week after this event ran. So I've been working on 18 hour days. Uh, I'm in a van going up to the, up the motorway. I've got some, tra some um, uh, travel reps in the back with me. I've got another police officer in the back with me. They're all asleep. I've got a driver who is giving it out about how this is all a big Israeli problem that it was caused by the Israeli. He's giving out to me about this. I couldn't care less at this time. All right, so I'm going, yeah, yeah. But he is really verbose about it. How it's the Israelis' problem that they, they caused this, they ruined his country, they are responsible for this. I pretend to be asleep to go to avoid him. I um I get into my into this to this you know, he's driving up the motorway, big motorway, normal motorway, desert either side. As I'm lying there there and pretending to be asleep, he comes off the motorway on a dirt track. He literally just across the head shoulder onto a dirt track. That wasn't normal. I'd done that journey before. That wasn't normal. So I'm sitting there going, that's not normal. Uh, there's a village. I see this village ahead of me. My head goes, he's going to kill us. He's going to take us there and he's going to make us hostages. It's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to put us in, in orange jumpsuits and then they're going to execute us on the camera. That was my thinking. These are, do you remember I said please like free stuff? This is the pen. 10 years old, this pen now. In the old days, these big pens, please slightly, because they're really sharp at the top. Conversations we have at three o'clock in the morning, go, cool, you can hurt someone with that. Uh, I had one of those in my, pen, in my pocket. Uh, I took it out and I thought, I can hurt someone with this. <laughs> uh, I'm holding this pen like that. And I'm sitting there going, if I hit him hard enough in the neck, I can save this. I can solve this problem. I can throw him out the door and then we can drive off. And then as I'm looking there, to my right, I'm literally seconds away from attacking this guy with my big pen, all right? I see the air traffic control tower. And what he'd done was he'd gone around the toll booth. I'd given him the money for the toll booth, all right? But he was gonna keep that money. <laughs> and he'd gone around on the desert. He'd avoided the toll booth completely. He nearly got bicked. And I was clearly making very bad decisions because I was abusing. So from the airport, I rang up the boss and said, we've got, I, I can't, we can't function anymore down here. You need to replace us. We've been on full go. Because of what happened to me in 1996, I knew that I wasn't functioning to the high level that I had got myself to because I was exhausted and I was going to kill someone for trying to avoid, for trying to keep two quid for, for the, uh, you know, a fee. So recognize, recognize when it's all going wrong for you. Okay, we won't talk about that. Um, quick, how long, about 15, 10 minutes, yeah? Yeah, so 
I grew up in an organization where stress and trauma were taboo words. You did not mention them, okay? And I'm very fortunate that you do. Uh, and it winds me up when I hear the word woke and all that sort of stuff, all right? Well, in our day, in our day, we had broken people. If there are much more broken people. Uh, nowadays, mental health is much, much more better, better around. But what I want to do is quickly give you a sort of, um, a sort of breakdown between identifying what is stress, what is trauma. So stress, let me just get to my slide. I want to make sure I do this right. So stress is exactly what it says there. It is when an individual interacts with the, the environment, they perceive it in a, in a certain way, and they give meaning to, to it. Stress is a short-term thing. Everyone in this room will suffer from stress. This stressed me out this, last night, this morning, it stressed me out because I had to stand up and do this. Fabian's a friend of mine. I didn't want to let Fabian down. I've got my sister, my brother-in-law, my father-in-law in the same building. Didn't want to upset them. Beatrice is a little bit scary. I definitely didn't want to upset Beatrice. <laughs> so, I didn't want to. so I was stressed out about this before I got in. I've given this demonstration loads and loads of times before, uh, but it still stressed me out. All right, that stress. And it usually manifests itself in distress. And what's the, um, what's the easiest way to recognize someone in distress? Crying. Physical thing, aren't they? Short-term thing, let them cry, okay? There are three triggers when you are in crisis. Remember, this is all about crisis. It's not about day-to-day, -day, all right? This is about when you are in a, in a crisis mode, as I was in Sus, as I was in the tsunami and, and all those other places that, that I've kind of dealt with. The first one, obviously, is the event that yourself that you are dealing with. Your past experiences will sort of, um, sort of dictate the level of stress. So me, I'm experienced in this term. I've been chasing, remember since 1996, I've been chasing these environments. I've been, I want to, because I want to get it right, all right? That, it doesn't stress me out. In fact, it's better for me. But there were other people from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office that were there with us as part of the team that couldn't handle it, was completely and utterly stressed. I watched the travel industry people fall apart in front of me, which is why I try and give this to the travel industry, because just to give them a little bit of an understanding. All right, what's going to happen? They just fell apart in front of me. Why wouldn't they? Because they've never seen a dead body. They've never seen green people. All right, they've never seen this sort of level of violence. So why wouldn't they fall, fall apart in front of me? So that caused them stress, and it probably actually caused them trauma as well, which we we'll go on to, 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 to later, later on. Oh, sorry. Um, the role of average staff is performing in, in, in crisis generally is a role that you are not used to. It's alien to you. All right, so you are not doing your day job. You are doing something outside of your day job. Uh, you as leaders have to recognize that you might be asking one of your staff to do something that they've never done before, all right? Because you are in, it's, a, it's one of those events. And to turn around and say, well, we're all in the same boat, doesn't cut, <laughs> doesn't cut. Because that individual might be, you might just be putting unknown huge amounts of stress on that individual. So you as leaders, it's your responsibility to make sure that you are aware that people could be completely stressed out by what you are asking them to do. Doesn't mean to say that they can't do it, but it does mean to say that you've got to manage it. You've got to watch it. You've got to lead. Okay. And then the final bit, um, failure, I can't tell you. You know, it started for me in 1996. I look back on everything now. I will look back on this, what I've done on this. I know the mistakes I've made here. <laughs> okay. All right. I know that perceived failures um, can have that, that sort of impact on you. I worry about what you think. Okay. And that's what your staff are doing. All right. That's what will happen, not only with your staff, but it happen to you as well, because you'll be thinking, hold on. Because you rely on your staff to solve the issue, to solve the problem, to make the crisis during your manner. But they, that, you know, that will, will impact on you as well and cause you stress. So it's really, really important that you become aware and you become, you know, that, that the moment it happens, staff care of your team is paramount to you. It's more important than solving the issue. 
more importantly, the event yourself is dealing with. Right? Because you've got to carry on working with those individuals later on. And that, as a, as a sergeant in charge of a team, Texas sergeant in charge of a team, that was me. When we landed, it was, I was on the, on, on, the, on the team all the way through. You're right, you're right. Constantly checking. I knew them well, so I knew that there were, if there was any behaviours that was a bit odd, I would deal with that. So what are the signs and symptoms of stress? There's loads. I wrote it down. Um, if I've arrested someone, um, they're usually sort of a bit red-faced. Um, they get a bit perspiring, they're perspiring. My God, they talk quickly. Especially, they either don't talk at all or they talk really, really quickly. Now, I haven't arrested someone for a very, very long time because I was a detective and I had people do that for me. But back when I was younger, all right, that was definitely occurring. It, it was, they were overexcited. They would talk quickly. Um, they would, you know, they would be angry. They would, they would, they would, sometimes they would be crying. But the base ones that you have to look out for, and if we had more time, we would have, we would have got it out of each other. You know, I'd have done it as one-to-one, -one, but my apologies. But, uh, but because we haven't got enough time, these are the ones that you have to have to look after. This is why you get to know your staff before you go into crisis, okay? You get to know what their habits are, you get to know what their families, who their families are, have they got issues at, at home? Take all that on board, all right? Because you're, you're, you're gonna have to listen to some of this, you're gonna have to cut through, so, so, so you know, accept that. Because you'll be able to see the change in them when you're in crisis mode. You'll be able to see all of these things. All right, is someone drinking too much? You'll be able to notice that if you know your staff. All right, why are they drinking too much? So if you don't remember anything from this two hours, try and remember this. Try and remember that you're, you, you know, you put your staff under, under stress. All right, and these are the things that will, that will affect you. How often do you, would you think of asking, how oh, do you sleep well? How often would you think of asking that? I ask it all the time. All right? Like they don't know when I talk to my family. You sleep well? No. I want to know. You know? I was out with Henry on Sunday. Asked him that. He didn't eat probably just at all. But I was asking, is he, you know, is there something that affects him? That's a thing for me. If you're not sleeping, that's an indicator for me. That's a big thing for me. All right, so please, if you don't know anything for the last two hours, remember this slide. Um, managing stress. What do you think is the best way to manage your stress? Out of all these pictures here, what do you think is the best way? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Exercise, you say that, but I wouldn't enjoy exercise. <laughs> Look at it. All right, I wouldn't enjoy exercise. You might. Perhaps that might be the best thing for you because you, you, that's what you do. Yeah, proof we might be the best for you. All right. But generally, it's this picture here talking to someone. All right. Talking to your peers may solve your problems or maybe allow you to manage your problems so that you don't end up talking to a psychiatrist. And it's your duty as that peer to listen to them. Even if you think, well, why are you getting stressed out about? Right? Why are you stressed? Remember what I said? Different people react to stress differently. Right? So they might be stressed, you're not. It's still your, it's your duty, <laughs> not only as a boss or leader, as a human being to, to help them out as much as possible. What's the worst thing? Alcohol. All right? Alcohol will never, ever, ever, ever solve any of your problems. All right? Even if you just go for a blow off, have a out. you're just delaying it, it'll impact on it. It will never, ever solve any of your problems. All right? I used to, I, that's another thing I used to monitor. Is I'm so boring about monitoring people's alcohol intake. All right? If we go out, I would watch them. Because right? now I know how much they would take on a normal night. And are they doing more? and I would see how they were the next morning. So I'm doing my preparation for when it all goes wrong later on. 
So start, social events are brilliant. They're great team working, but they're also a really good indicator for you. The good intelligence gathering sessions for you. Right, that's what he drinks. Okay, he might want 20 pints. That might be his night out. That's how he deals. What's he like the next morning? Okay. All right. If he's doing that during crisis, so that's the big problem. Right, let's talk about, um, let me talk, I'm with through these. Trauma. Trauma is totally different to stress. Stress is a short term thing that should be, hopefully, will be solved, resolved by either by yourself or by management helping to you, you know, taking yourself out of the, of the situation. Trauma is so deeply entrenched. It's just, you know, uh, it, it will take a lot, lot more than hoovering. Uh, you can see there are three types of main types. It's, it's much more different to that. I'm just giving you a basic one. Acute is basically a one-off where you are a witness to a one-off event. Someone was murdered in front of you. Um, you're, you know, you watch someone die in a road traffic accident or that sort of one-off event that will cause you uh, what they call an acute trauma reaction. Chronic is when you're exposed to event after event after event after event. That's what I've got. Okay. And I denied it for years because I was a police officer and that's what I did. So I just denied it, just stuck it out now. And it's only since I left the police and that I've, I've, I've come to terms with it um, that I've accepted that I've got, I've got chronic PTSD. And why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I have? Uh, my manifests themselves in panic attacks. All right, so I get massive panic attacks and they primarily happen when I give public talks like this, okay? So that's why I give public talks like this, because right? that's the problem. In my head, my the problem is uh, they manifest themselves when I get public talks, so I'll give more public talks. So surely the more that I give, so I've now got the fear of a panic attack. I've had a panic attack for about six months. All right, but I've got that fear in, 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 in me. All right, complex is when it's, You've got someone who is a sufferer, who is a sufferer of domestic violence, for instance, and then they also have uh, a sexual assault involved in it. Your staff, your staff, they will be guaranteed in your office. There will be a sufferer of domestic violence in there. All right, it's a hidden killing. People sit there and go, oh, no, no, no. You've got the perfect family life, perfect, perfect husband, boyfriend, whatever. All right. If you find out, dug a little bit deeper, it might be one of their stress signs. They might have a stress indicator because they've got domestic issues. Okay, so if you're doing your intelligence as you're, as you're, as you're going along, you might be able to help and see if they're individual now. All right, coping with trauma. It is, like you say, um, we talk about not re-traumatizing someone. Um, I would always recommend with trauma, get a professional involved as soon as you possibly can. Okay, because they are they are specifically trained to deal with, with trauma. It's not something that you can have a chat with in, you know, over a cup of tea. Uh, and it's also down for you to recognize the difference between stress and trauma. Is someone experiencing stress or are they traumatized? All right. Uh, patience is, is a good thing and support of, of your peers is hugely, hugely, hugely beneficial. Um, I think I'll call it a day. I'll miss the grief bit. So no, I'll miss that. that. Is that is that right? Yeah, Hi. yeah, yeah. But that, because we've run out of time, I thought we had another fifteen minutes. So I do apologise. I've rushed through that 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 bit along. A uh, bit of a comms issue you know, there with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but again, that's a comms issue. And my comms <laughs> was dodgy there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, were, were you scared after uh, I, I don't know, is the answer. <laughs> I don't know if I was scared. I know I reacted. And I know that I've done, that's what I, I know now that I go that way. So I've gone into buildings, I've gone stuff where I shouldn't be. Uh, how long did you decide uh, with uh, 4 one, one crevice of January?
How often do I? Yes. Well, it depends on the, what the, the actual time that it takes to, to deal with it. It depends on what the, the crisis but, is. But in most of the time, uh, we have a nurse for injury. injury, injury. Yeah. And uh, if the crisis uh, lasts uh, so long, then how can we deal with uh, yeah. it? Yeah. There has to be an exit strategy. There has to be a close to it. You have to recognize you as a, as a leader that that's what you have to do. So it, it depends on each individual sort of incident that you are dealing with. Yeah, does that make sense? Mm, yeah. I'll tell you, when we finish, we'll, we'll talk. Right? <laughs> Thank you for the chat later. Yeah. So I just have to use the phone, the microphone also, otherwise those on Zoom will not uh, listen to us. So I'll take the opportunity for as long as we want. We have coffee and cake at the end of the room, but before we go to there, I think I wanted to just have a, a couple of um, yeah, points of reflection of how I interpret. I take here the, the, the leadership uh, as the chair of the session. Uh, taking lots of notes, I agree on uh, Mike's point, right? We need to take notes. I always keep telling this to my students. We need notes. That the, the, the actual um, uh, action of making notes help us remember uh, and whether, whether that is actually. It's something that you need as a proof, yeah. right, of your memories and what you remember. But I think that something that really came out of your talk is first, whenever he and his colleagues were going on a scene, uh, you didn't know what to expect. No. So, and every time it could be a different outcome and you have to deal with that. Now, that's very much like what it would be like working in an organization. We think we know our organization or our own business or um, our own career, we think we know it all, but every day is a new is a new day, is a new story. Yeah. So that's a, a point one. Uh, and the second point, I think, is also this idea of uh, not being able to control. The, we, we basically have to train ourselves to operate in a situation of no support. So worst case scenarios, I have no telephone, no coverage, uh, no colleagues to help. How do I handle? Now, this is a good, I think, training uh, landscape to think how can we become more resilient? Yeah. I mean, I think we discussed this when, when we introduced the, the class, right? The, the, yeah. This, this idea of resilience. So I don't know if you had comments on that. I have. Of course, I, I, I invite questions. On, yeah, on one of the course. things that I was going to mention later on, uh, let me have a go at it. Found it here. Is that one? Um, yeah, here we go. Um, so, what you're feeling is normal. That's what we're, 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 we're trying to establish, okay? Your behavior after you're uh, dealing with an incident might seem odd to, to us, all right? It might seem odd to you, but it's normal behavior, okay? And it's down to us to recognize that that person is individually traumatized and their behavior, that's why I was made great play about how um, you get to know your staff, your staff beforehand, all right? It is normal. Um, don't avoid talking. Where is it? There was a big one. That's it. It's not a quick term fix either. Okay. You are not going to resolve this in a, you know, a quick session or down the pub, down, down in Hoover or, or something like that. If someone's entrenched, got either one of those acute or, or you know, complex, uh, they are, they are, it's a long term thing for them to deal with. Uh, it's not an overnight solution to solve that. The earlier, the quicker you get the practical help, the, the, you know, the professional help, the better it, is, it will be for you as an organization and for you as, as the individual there. Investing in your staff, even though it might cost you some money, uh, you're going to get that back in droves because that staff member will actually become more loyal to you as well and they'll be fixed as much as they can be. That and so yeah. Can, can I invite the audience to ask questions, please? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And um, first of all, my admiration to all your duty and trajectory, and that's exactly my point. I mean, I do respect a lot of people, and, and we need um, that character of people in that kind of positions and security most like first responders yeah but how after like 
how do you manage yourself at least uh, to to not become sensible to to I mean to nor this normalize um, I, to prevent yeah. normalizing that type of of violence. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't stand it when someone has to deliver a death message or goes, because we have to go into a room with dead people all, all the time. You know, we, we call to any death, please go around and, and, and um, the detective sergeant, you should turn up and say, oh, that's not suspicious. That, that's, you know. If you walk into that room and it's a normal thing for you and your heart doesn't skip a beat, then you, there's no place for you in policing as far as I'm concerned. You've not got the compassion. You've not got empathy. You should never, ever, ever get used to um, that sort of uh, that sort of thing. Never. I've I've seen hundreds, hundreds of, of, of bodies, and every one it hurts me to go into that room, and it's had an effect on me. That's, and I would have I for for thirty years I have um, put it away. I'm really lucky, some would say unlucky, because I, I, I'm a little bit emotionally unattached. Right? And that's another thing I got from my father. <laughs> okay, so I'm able to step back and look at things, uh, things like, like that. I'm able to deal with it as a project. I'm able to sort of look at it like, like that. But there's no doubt that it, it's have, had an impact on, on, on me and my mental health uh, without shadow, shadow of a doubt. But because of the, of the fortunate bit of being that emotionally sort of um, reserved, and that's difficult for my family. All right? I'm aware of the impact that has on my, on, on my, 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 my particularly my partner, who's incredibly emotional. All right? We couldn't be more chalk and cheese. All right? But I'm aware of the fact that how my um, emotional reservedness will impact on, on, on her. So yeah, I was in complete denial of this until I left the police. I, I had two years when I completely retired and did nothing for two years. <laughs> I mean, it was great, but it wasn't. <laughs> I, you know, it, it was damaging to me. So now, by recognising it, I very rarely get panic attacks now because I tell you that I get panic attacks. I used to get panic attacks all the time when I couldn't tell anyone I had panic attacks. Because I tell you, I don't care what you think. If people think, oh, you're weak or whatever, fine, I don't care, all right? But because I tell you, that's the problem solved. So if I have a panic attack in front of you, you know oh, I'm having a panic attack. You're also from a generation that accept that, all right? My generation might not. So that ability to put things away in a box is, is essential. For your own sort of mental health and also for your, for your others, but not to the fact where you're suppressing your 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 feelings. Your, you know, if you're putting away forgetting about it, yeah, that's damaging as well. It's a real fine line. It's a real, real fine line, which is why always make sure you've got a best friend, okay, that you can talk to uh, about. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Are you agree? Are you all right with that? Or? <laughs> Fine. Yes, no, I agree. Please. Um, there is no right or wrong. No, there is. Said there is no stupid answer. There is no stupid answer. So, Vas, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm a case consultant in the school, and then um, we get asked a lot by our employers that our students should be more resilient. Yes. And that's something that's really hard to teach to our students how to become resilient, especially in this generation. Yeah. You know, uh, latest stats published yeah. uh, yesterday saying that uh, the population of 18 to 24 year olds suffer so from mental health. And that's yes. Yes. a yes. big issue. So, what advice <laughs> would you So, So, I, I know that I, I see that because I've got a 24 year old daughter, and uh, my God, everything's a drama for her everything all right so she's gone too far this 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 way i mean she's had to endure her mother died all right she's 24 years she, she watched her mother die all right so she's had to endure to endure trauma but i know that she is um that that it is a common thing that is 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 thrown at thrown at the youth of, of, of today i don't necessarily agree with it um but i do see that resilience is really really important for, for you as a company, as an organization. And if you have dealing with staff members that are, that 
cannot cope with what you are doing, it is a huge problem for that, that company, isn't it? In the same way as it is for, for, for policing. Uh, my police officers, I, have, I expect them to go towards the trouble, not move away from it, unless they're in danger, obviously. Okay. Now, in terms of resilience, it's a real balancing act, Fabian. I, I, and I, I can see from both sides of the picture, because I, I, I bet a lot of those people that are talking about resilience come from my generation. Okay. And they've got, you know, what they'll be sitting there going, look at him talking about his panic attacks and his, <laughs> you know, and so so they come across that. So it is a balancing act because there is, there are times when people have got to suck it up. All right? And I've been in those situations where you have to go, right, we have to suck this up. We have to deal with this ourselves and we have to cut through it and, and, and carry on because we rely on other, we, we, there are other individuals there that, that that need up, need up, need our help. So it's easier in policing in, in, in that respect because that's what we, we've got to do. Business-wise, it, it's got to be a two-way sheet, three, three, hasn't it? The staff, the, the, the leadership, the, the, have got to do exactly what I'm doing. They've got to invest in their staff. They've got to be be able to underpin um, them, their, their staff's mental health. When I was in the Air Force, we had a guy called um, General Schwarzkopf who run, who was an American general. And he, um, Ran the first Gulf War um, uh, thing, the first Gulf War in 1991 that, that, that took place. He came out in 1990, or I was still in the Air Force at the time, and uh, he gave a lecture in a very much in a room like this. And he was like a huge general, massive general, big, big, clear figure in there. Uh, and he was sitting there talking. We all got forced to go and sit and listen to him talk about it. And his, his whole message to the leadership team around there was prepare your staff for the time when you are asking them to run up the hill into a machine gun. All right, get it so that they will do that for, for you. All right, make sure that their conditions, that their working conditions, you know, make sure that everything is, is right for them. It's like the Galacticos and the football teams, you know, the footballers get everything is, they just walk in and play football because everything else is done, is done for them. Because that, that's still, they know that they are high performance athletes that they need to focus on uh, focus on, on that. So all their mental health, if the Premier League or the football clubs are spending money on a player's mental health, as we know they do, that shows that they're investing in that, in that player, doesn't it? So it's a balancing act and it's it's more resilient, it's more on the company to actually to express that resilience as well. So the company have got to say, turn around and say, right, we've got to change our policies so that we can make sure that those individuals are resilient because they know that the support that we are going to give them. And at the same time, the people in the, in the, in the, in the front line are going to have to do the reverse. I'm going to have to power through some of this and deal with those issues later because the company are going to help me do that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you for your speech, and I have a question is that uh, what's the most important thing to make a decision we, when we face some urgent uh, crisis? So, first of all, get the right staff. That's your, the, the team that you have around you uh, are going to be your bed, you know, the, the linchpin, the bedrock of getting, getting it right. All right. And secondly, make sure your communications are correct. And thirdly, make sure you know what your, your strategy is, what your objectives are. What, what are you hoping to achieve at the end of at the end of it? What's that about? That's what that, that that's you know, those three things. There's a whole host of things that you can should do. But first of all, always staff, because I always look at staff. Always think about staff. That's my thing, is, is staff. Make sure they're the right people, make sure their welfare is in other things. All right strategy right but you've got to make sure your objectives are there when i go into a family deal with a murder all right i'm i'm thinking of leaving them their exit strategy from them all right when can i do that okay so long term long term term planning uh, in that respect so those are the three things that i would make sure that you are always always on top of your staff all right your strategy and you know your purpose uh, how am I going to get to that? I did them the wrong way around, but your purpose should be for your strategy. <laughs> All right, <laughs> don't know, but that, that's, how, that's how you're going to get to it. And also be fluid and flexible in your strategy as well. 
right? Planning, uh, you know, what you do, you know, I'm gonna plan for this. <laughs> and then something will come along and change that plan. Don't, don't be going, all right, got it wrong there, change it. Thank you. Yeah. All good? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So I hope you all think again. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. And, and keep, yeah, we keep the position going yeah. for you copy. Okay. okay. Thank you and very much. thank you to the partners for attending. <laughs> I think this is a special uh, audience today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to learn um, a group gathering, if you like, for teachers. I know there's not many of you, but I'm uh -huh. happy there. Online. Yeah, the people online. Thank you to those online. I'm sorry, I would not be. Yeah, I do agree with you. Yeah, yeah. No, Check sometimes every company visits. Mm -hmm. On the handshake. handshake. Yeah, yeah. check on the handshake the event. You mean like having a visit of the company? Yes, for example, we check. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Shall I take it? I don't want to be on it. I want to, but uh, if you go, I'm happy. Uh, the sister is moving. Yeah. She has a show. I have no chance. Double, 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 double. It's funny because my mom is always wanting to, to come and listen to one of my lectures. Like, you can't. You can't. Yeah. 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 My mom can't either. Just press, <laughs> just press the button, I guess. Okay, you get yeah. it. Make it. A big group and full of. Oh, can you put a nice slide of it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the slide off. Uh, you to oh. Oh. <laughs> um, the yeah. call is off, right? After those ones.
Do you want, do you want, do you want the thing? Do you want the... Slide. Unity. 